Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's webcast called Fishing for Cures, using the zebrafish to find new treatments for blood cancers. In this presentation, Dr. Berman will review some examples of successful zebrafish models of blood diseases and their future potential to inform and improve the outcome for patients with blood cancers. My name is Sonia Mudo, Community Program Coordinator for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. I will be the host of this online event. During the webcast, you will hear only my voice and the speaker's voice. Since there are many of you, questions may be asked at the end, but only online using the chat function. The presentation will last approximately one hour and will be followed by a 15 to 20 minute question period. The presentation is being recorded. Therefore, you will be able to listen to it again on our website while following along with a PowerPoint presentation. We will send you an email when everything is available online. Next slide, please. Our mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life for patients and their families. We offer support to people affected by blood cancer every step of the way. Please reach out to us if need be. We have several informative tools such as fact sheets and booklets available on our website llscanada.org. We also have a series of educational video videos accessible on our website. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jason Berman, who has generously accepted to share his knowledge with us. Dr. Berman is the attending physician, Division of Hematology Oncology, as well as the associate Chair Research, Department of Pediatrics at IWK Health Center. Additionally, he is the Professor of Pediatrics, Microbiology and Immunology, and Pathology at Dalhousie University. Over to you, Dr. Berman. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this uh, webinar. Uh, as mentioned by Sonia in her generous introduction, I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist and a clinician scientist. And today I'm going to hopefully convince you how we use a small tropical fish called the zebrafish to answer questions in uh, blood cancers with the goal of improving outcomes. Now, I know that people that have signed into the webcast are familiar with uh, LLS, and, and, and I hope that you'll see how the work that we're doing really does fit its mission to um, uh, improve the lives of uh, patients with uh, blood cancers. I think when most people think of blood cancers, they think of adults with blood cancers, and many of the people, uh, many of you who are on the, uh, the webcast today, uh, maybe yourselves or have a loved one um, uh, who is fighting the fight of a blood cancer. But I'm a pediatric uh, hematologist oncologist, and so when I think of blood cancers, I think of children with blood cancers. And so I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction as to why um, uh, we think of blood cancers in children and, um, and how that's a bit different than the blood cancers we're used to thinking of in adults. So cancer is not something we tend to think of in children. We think of it as a disease of, uh, of older people, but cancer is the most common cause of death in children between one to 15 years of age. And there is a difference um, in racial background. Of 650, uh, patients diagnosed with cancer, one in every 650 are going to be diagnosed before the age of 15, so during childhood. Leukemia is the most common cancer that we see in children. This is quite different than in adult cancers where uh, the incidence of blood cancers is uh, dwarfed by co uh, common cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. But in the pediatric world, uh, leukemia is the most common cancer that we see. And as you see in this list, lymphomas, that includes both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, have a fairly high incidence. So as a pediatric oncologist, blood cancers make up a significant portion of the patients that we look after. In children, leukemia tends to peak in toddlerhood, as you can see from this um, graph 
showing that before five years of age is the most common time when we see uh, leukemia and predominantly acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia, we tend to see in older children. The distribution of types of leukemia differs between children and adults. With adult leukemia, AML or acute myeloid leukemia is the most common type of leukemia that we see, with a significant portion of patients having chronic lymphoid leukemia, CLL, and chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. In pediatrics, this is quite different. Three quarters of patients with leukemia in, uh, in childhood have ALL or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is only 11% of adult leukemias. AML makes up about 20%. CML is quite rare, and CLL does not occur in childhood. And so these different uh, types of diseases and distributions make uh, the practice and care uh, in children uh, quite different than it would be in adults. Now, childhood ALL, again, the most common uh, leukemia and the most common cancer we see as pediatric oncologists, is generally touted as one of the greatest success stories in uh, oncology. As you can see from this graph, looking at the last 40 years or so, there has been tremendous improvements in the survival of children with ALL, and this is due to multi-agent chemotherapy, clinical trials, and risk stratification to really try to target specific uh, intensities of therapy to higher risk patients. But as you can see on this graph, we're not curing everyone. There are still a lot of children with ALL who are not cured. Even more significant is patients who have relapse cancer. Patients with relapse childhood cancers do not do very well. And you can see here, if this is really across the spectrum, including blood cancers like uh, ALL, AML, um, solid tumors like brain tumors and sarcomas, um, and lymphomas like non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And so when these children relapse with their um, disease, with their cancer coming back, the cure rates are quite low and we really need to try to improve things. So most uh, childhood cancers, like most adult cancers, are treated with chemotherapy. This is really non-specific uh, treatment designed to kill rapidly dividing cells that are cancer cells. And the analogy that I usually use when I, I talk to people about this is taking a cannon to kill a fly against the wall. You're going to kill the fly, which is the cancer cells, but you're going to cause a lot of collateral damage. And uh, I'm going to speak more about uh, collateral damage and side effects of chemotherapy uh, later in the presentation. The problem in the case of uh, high-risk disease or relapse disease is those patients have already seen the best chemotherapy that they can receive. And so giving them more chemotherapy when their disease comes back doesn't have a very high chance of working, and that's reflected in these outcomes on these graphs. So in order to improve therapy, we really need to find uh, more targeted therapy, more specific therapy, and in order to do that, we need to understand these cancers on a more basic level. What's going on in the cell? What's going on with the genes that are causing these cancers, these leukemias and lymphomas to develop. And so, and so I'm going to talk about one of these disorders, AML, acute myeloid leukemia, which again is the most common leukemia in adults and makes up about 20% of childhood leukemia, closer to 30% in uh, the adolescent age group. As you can see from the graph on, on, um, uh, on the right, the survival of these patients, and this is uh, all comers, is not particularly good. And in contrast to what I showed you for childhood ALL over the last 40 years, the, the, uh, the needle has really not shifted much in terms of outcome. So for adult AML, the outcomes are in the 30 to 40%. In pediatrics, it's a bit higher, but still less than 60%. And with more intensive chemotherapy that's used in AML, we've really had limited improvement over the last 40 years. So what we really need is targeted therapy that um, is focused on the genetic abnormalities. And to understand that, it's important to understand in broad terms how cancer-causing genes occur. And so this is a little bit of uh, molecular oncology 101. 
And this race car is a really good analogy to think about how these genes function in cancer. And in cancer, the genes may be an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene. An oncogene or a proto-oncogene that turns into an oncogene is like stepping on the gas. This is a gene that when it's turned on, when it's overexpressed, um, you can develop cancer because this gene gives growth signals to the cell and makes it divide out of control. The tumor suppressor gene really functions like a break. It's a gene that when it's present, stops the cell from dividing too much, keeps that cell in check, and when it's gone, when it's lost in a cancer cell, that removes that control signal, and now um, the cancer uh, grows, uh, can grow out of control. And as you see in those pictures there of the race car, in both cases, the car speeds up and crashes uh, into the wall uh, and becomes, becomes cancerous. And in some cases, you may have both an oncogene and a tumor suppressor gene. And I'm gonna give you some examples as we go through. So first example I'm going to give you is uh, of a fusion oncogene. And this fusion oncogene has a complicated name. It's called NUP98 HOXA9. Those are the names of the two genes that are involved. And when these genes come together, they form an oncogene signal. And this is one of the highest risk features in both pediatric and adult AML. How do you get a fusion oncogene? Well, on the left side of the screen is what's called a karyotype. So these are your chromosomes. As people probably remember, if you think way back to your biology classes, in every cell you have 46 chromosomes, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father. Every cell has the same chromosomes, but different genes are turned on in different cells, and that's what makes their cells do their job, become a liver cell or a skin cell, and know that the program, that's like the computer program in the cell that tells that cell what to do. So on the left side of your screen there, you have a normal karyotype. We have chromosomes from one to 22, and then the sex chromosomes, in this case, X and Y, so this is a male karyotype. And these chromosomes all look normal. And you can see that in a karyotype, they're paired together so that you can look at the two chromosome ones and twos and threes, et cetera. When you have a fusion oncogene, and these are very common in leukemia and lymphoma, you get a piece of one chromosome breaks off and attaches to another chromosome. In this case, it's a piece of chromosome seven and a piece of uh, chromosome 11, and you can see there at the bottom, it says translocation of T711, P15, P15. This means a translocation, a piece of chromosome 7 has broken off, and it's actually the P means that it's the short arm. So the little top part, which is shorter than the bottom part, has broken off from chromosome 11 and has traveled and attached to the top part, the P arm of chromosome 11. That's brought these two genes, NUP98 and HOXA9, together. And those two genes, because they're normally on different chromosomes, they don't belong together. And when you bring them together, that creates an oncogene that leads to leukemia. So we use the zebrafish model to study um, uh, leukemia. And my job now is to try to convince you how zebrafish, which aren't even mammals, how can we use these zebrafish to uh, understand and model uh, blood cancers and find better treatment? So the zebrafish is very highly conserved compared to humans, and they're conserved on the gene level, on the chromosome level, and even on the organ level. Even when you look at the zebrafish, this is a zebrafish larva, and you'll see a lot of the work we do is in the larva. Those are the baby uh, zebrafish that are uh, born only a couple of days, uh, when they're born and only a couple of days old. They have brains and kidneys and livers and blood systems that are very much the same as what we find in humans, which is very, very humbling. In addition, from a single pairing of adult and female zebrafish, we get large numbers of embryos or larvae. So we can get 200 embryos from a single pairing. The embryos are transparent, as you'll see, so we can see things that are going on. And they're small. So as you can see from this picture here, this is uh, about 20 different larvae on a Canadian nickel. So that, that way you can appreciate how tiny these things are that we're gonna be working with, because you're gonna see these big pictures, but that's the size of them. 
We can manipulate their genes, and their genes, as I mentioned, are very similar to the genes we find in humans, including the cancer-causing genes. And this ability to manipulate the genes allows us to make models of human blood cancers in the zebrafish. We can also transplant human leukemia cells into the zebrafish and look at responses to treatment in real time. And I will show you that in a couple of slides. People often ask me what zebrafish look like. And if you came to the lab, and I've given many tours for the uh, LLS uh, in the lab, this is what adult zebrafish look like. They're about the size of, um, uh, of a guppy and have stripes. Um, we have special um, mutant zebrafish that are uh, completely transparent, these pigment mutants called Casper, like the friendly ghosts that don't have stripes. And we use those to be able to see cells better because we don't have their uh, view blocked by the stripes. And then we have lots of genetic models in the lab, like these transgenic fish, in which all the blood vessels are outlined in green. Zebrafish embryos develop very quickly. And the best way to show you the uh, transparency and how quickly they develop is this little movie. So this is a zebrafish egg that's split in two. So here's the, the two cells. And then this is the yolk sac, which is sort of like the placenta. It provides nutrition to the zebrafish embryo for the first five days of life. And as I play this movie, you'll see this is going through the first 22 hours of life as a zebrafish embryo. All the cells are dividing rapidly on top of the yolk sac, and you're beginning to see the, um, the uh, um, uh, embryo take shape. You'll see at the top there, the head's going to develop. You'll see the eye. You'll see the muscles developing along the back and the tail at the bottom. And that's a zebrafish embryo at about 22 hours. At 24 hours, the zebrafish embryo looks more like this picture with the head and the tail at right angles to each other. And at this point, the heart is pumping, blood development has started, and you can see how quickly these develop and how that's a really helpful tool for us studying um, uh, blood development and cancer. And then usually somewhere between 42 and 72 hours, like three days or so, the zebrafish embryos are enclosed in a chorion, which is like a little shell, and they will hatch out of that shell and begin swimming around. But with that background, I want to go back to modeling leukemia and this high-risk type of leukemia, this high-risk type of AML that expresses this, this uh, oncogene, this fusion oncogene, nup 98 hox uh, a 9 that I showed you a couple of slides ago. And so what we did is we took the human nup 98 hox a 9 derived from a patient, and we put that into what's called a construct. Um, and this construct allows us to express this um, cancer gene specifically in white blood cells because of this black box here. This, this is a signal called a promoter that tells that gene only to be expressed in white blood cells. And we want to model leukemia, so that's where we want it expressed, in white blood cells. And we also, so we don't have it expressed too quickly and we can control when it's expressed. It's in this special um, uh, construct where there's this stop signal and this green signal. And in order to activate it, we have to cross these fish with these other fish that um, have this, uh, express this protein called CRE that's activated when we take these fish, breed them together, then heat up their, um, heat up the larvae to 37 degrees, and then this CRE comes, cuts this out, and then you get expression of this um, fusion gene under, the, um, under this promoter. And we do all this by injecting these constructs into these embryos at the one cell stage. And you can see here, these are zebrafish that we've injected. You can see because of the GFP, these um, uh, embryos. So I showed you the two cell embryo on the other slide in the movie. You can see that they grow, glee, grow uh, glow green. And you can see here over time, these are their blood cells, these green blood cells. These are white blood cells in these zebrafish that um, uh, express this um, fusion gene. Now, I mentioned to you that zebrafish um, are very similar to humans in um, uh, their genetics, but also in their organ systems, and that includes their blood system. And as most people on the phone probably know, in humans, all of our blood cells are made in the bone marrow. In zebrafish, blood cells are made in the kidney marrow. So in their kidneys, they have areas, patches in their kidneys um, that make human blood cells. And when you take part of their kidney and break it apart 
and do flow cytometry, which is what we do clinically in the bone marrow to make a leukemia diagnosis, you can see all these different types of blood cells that we have in, um, uh, in humans, erythrocytes, our red blood cells, um, lymphocytes, and then different types of white blood cells. And we're able to see all those. So in these zebrafish that express this NUP98 HOXA9, what happens to them when they grow up? Well, they actually develop a leukemia or a pre-leukemia type condition. These are normal zebrafish, so you can see them here. These are adults. And this slide here is pointing to their kidneys, which is, this is a um, taken as a section, um, uh, taking a slice of the fish and putting it on a slide. And this is pointing to their kidneys here, this purple area. And then when you blow that up, this is what a normal zebrafish kidney looks like. It looks actually quite a bit like a human kidney. It's got something called the glomerulus, which is the filtering unit and tubules, but what's different is it has these areas here where blood cells develop. So these are, this is like the bone marrow in the zebrafish where the blood cells develop. And that's normal. But in our um, fish that express this NUP98 HOXA9, you can see they have a big distended tummy, and that's because their kidneys are enlarged, shown here, and filled with all these pre-leukemic and leukemic cells. You can't see any of these tubules or glomeruli, any normal kidney structures, because the whole kidney has been taken over by these abnormal looking blood cells. And that's really this uh, myeloproliferative disease, this sort of pre-myeloid leukemia condition. Um, this is really what happens in, in humans. And we saw this in almost a quarter of these fish after cl almost close to um, uh, uh, two years um, uh, of age. So that's pretty neat. But what's even neater is that we can see abnormalities in these fish shortly after they're born. So this is after only 28 hours of life. And if we look at these fish, so these are zebrafish embryos. I'll orient you. This is the head. This is the tail. And this is the yolk sac. This is shown in a side profile. And if we look at here, we're looking at what happens to the red blood cells and the white blood cells in this fish. And so what we do is we're able to mark these specific cells and identify them with a label. And so GATA1 is a label for red blood cells, and this is what it normally looks like. And L-plastin, LCP1, is a label for some white blood cells, and th that's what all these little dots are. These are all white blood cells in the zebrafish. So this is wild type. These are normal fish. This is what we'd see. And I think you can appreciate in the fish that we made that express this oncogene, this NUP98 HOXA9 that we've activated, all the red cells basically have disappeared. So this is equivalent to anemia that we would see in patients where the red blood cells are low. And that's because there's this big increase in the number of white blood cells compared to what we see normally. And so we have increased white blood cells and low red blood cells. This is very much what we see in leukemia and pre-leukemic conditions. So this is a pretty good model of what happens in patients. And the reason that it's cool to be able to do this in these um, young fish, in the embryos, is because we can then study what other genes might be involved. And so what we do is we take these embryos and we're able to pull out their genetic material. And then we take that in material and we put it on what's called a chip um, to identify which genes on the, and on that chip, there's a bunch of different genes. And so we take the fish genetic material put it on that chip, and if genes are increased, then we see them, we, we see them go up. These are genes that are increased. And if they're, uh, and if they're, um, uh, and if they're decreased, we see them go down, and that's shown in yellow. And because we use this with fish on a chip, and I live in the Maritimes, of course, we call this fish and chips. Now, one of the genes that we identified is a gene called DNMT1. That was one of the genes shown over here that was one of the most highly, um, uh, uh, sorry, one of the most highly expressed in yellow. So I misspoke before. The yellow is increased expression and the red is decreased expression. So that was one of the most highly expressed genes. And you can see here that's shown uh, when we measure it here uh, on this bar. And that suggests that in these fish that have this NUP98 HOXA9, this gene is increased more and maybe uh, causes problems. And what this gene does uh, is shown on, on this next slide. 
this gene, DNMT1, makes a protein with the same name, DNMT1. And what I'm showing here on this slide is this is DNA. This is what where all the genes are uh, inside the chromosomes. And inside the cells, this DNA is wrapped around these proteins that sort of look like hockey pucks here. And when they're wrapped not tightly like this, you're able to um, express the genes there and the normal program for, the, uh, for white blood cell development can occur. But when you have too much of this DNMT1, like we see in this type of leukemia, the, these, um, these hockey pucks are brought much closer together. The DNA is in a closed format and those genes aren't expressed. And because those genes aren't expressed, the white blood cells stay immature. That growth and development program isn't started. And that's what we see in leukemia, too many immature young blood cells. And so because DNMT1, which we discovered in our fish, seems to be important here, can we target this and reverse things? And we found in the zebrafish that we could. So there's a drug called decitabine that some on the phone might be familiar with. It's used to treat myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a pre-leukemic condition. It's also used in some, some types of AML, acute myeloid leukemia. And what we, decitabine specifically targets DNMT1. And so we wanted to see if we added decitabine to the water, and in this case, we can add our drug treatment just to the water where these fish are, we wanted to see if that made a difference. And so again here, this is normal zebrafish. Here you can see the increased number of white blood cells that I showed you before. And look what happens when we treat with decitabine. We're able to restore those white blood cells back to a normal level. And the same thing we're able to do, um, this is showing white blood cells. And these markers, these mark the blood stem cells, the cells where all the blood cells come from, which are also increased um, in this leukemia model, but we're able to restore those cells in terms of looking at the number of uh, black dots here, we're able to restore those cells to normal levels with the cytidine. So this really suggests that this, type, this drug, and this is a drug that's already FDA approved and used in some types of blood cancers, could be helpful in this type of high-risk leukemia. And the way, um, the way that um, DNMT1 uh, makes the, the, that um, DNA compact um, around those hockey pucks is by adding something called methyl groups. And that gives a signal for the DNA to close down on itself. And so what we tested here, uh, this looks at the level of those methyl groups, which is called methylation. Um, and um, you can see here, this is what we normally see, the green line in normal um, situations, that methylation is way increased in the case of our NUP98 HOXA9 fish, and when we treat with the cytobine, the yellow line, we can restore those levels back to normal. So that's all really interesting in the fish, but is that relevant to people? And so that's what this next slide shows, is now that we made this discovery of this DNMT1 gene, is this relevant in human leukemia? And this shows that we went to two large databases, um, the TCGA and this other database, published by this author, uh, Wooters et al., and we're able to show that um, high DNT1 expression is a high-risk feature in AML. So this shows that the discovery that we've made in zebrafish really corresponds to a high-risk feature in human AML, and now we can take this information and think about the possibility of using the drug that we found, decitabine, to treat these patients. And because it's already an FDA-approved drug, the ability to take this discovery from the zebrafish to the clinic may be easier than if it was a brand new drug that we knew nothing about. So I talked a little bit about this model that we made with NUP98 HOXA9 and said we made it was a AML or a pre-AML type model. And we know that there's a number of different conditions that um, predispose people to developing high-risk types of blood cancers. And while we all want to find better treatments for high-risk blood cancers, like I just showed you in NUP98 HOXA9 AML, it would be even more exciting to be able to prevent these uh, high-risk types of leukemia from developing in the first place. And so if we can find diseases where, um, where we know we have a, um, a clue that this is going to happen and the risk is increased, can we intervene? 
And so one group of these disorders is called inherited bone marrow failure syndrome. And these are diseases where the bone marrow that I mentioned before, where all the blood cells are made, does not work properly to make blood cells. If the bone marrow, when we normally look in the bone marrow, we should see all sorts of blood cells. And when you look in these patients, the bone marrows look pretty empty. The blood cells are not there. Um, and bone marrow failure syndromes affect adults, but they also affect children. And so as a pediatric oncologist, this is a, a, this is a group of disorders that I'm really interested in. And these children, not only do they have bone marrow failure, but often they have other problems. They may have developmental delay. They may have various types of mental illness. They may have physical abnormalities. And as I mentioned, they have high risk rates of developing leukemia, particularly AML. Many of these bone marrow failure syndromes are caused by problems um, in the ribosome. And so I've just put up a little cartoon here of the ribosome. The ribosome is this brown, um, structure here inside your cells and it's made up of a large part and a small part and its job is to take the RNA that comes from the DNA that we've been talking about and help it code to make the proteins that do all the jobs in the cell. And so if the ribosome is not put together properly because of an abnormality, it doesn't make these proteins properly and the cell doesn't work properly, and that particularly affects cells that are dividing all the time, like our blood cells. And so many of these ribosome problems lead to bone marrow failure, some of these other issues too that I mentioned, but a lot of them have bone marrow failure. So can we model some of these disorders uh, in the zebrafish? Um, and we believe that we can, and so here is an example um, this is work that we've done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Yigal Dror at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, who has a registry of bone marrow uh, failure patients across Canada. And these are in children that he does not, uh, that have bone marrow failure, that don't have a clear cause of bone marrow failure. He does genetic testing to identify new genes that cause bone marrow failure. And this is one of the genes he found called PARN or poly-A poly specific ribonuclease, and it's involved in making the ribosome. And so what we wanted to do in this project <clears throat> was see if this gene really did, whether the loss of this gene really did cause bone marrow failure. And so here are zebrafish embryos. Again, you're hopefully getting used to seeing these pictures of these embryos. Here's the eye and the head, the yolk sac and the tail. And here we're looking at a bunch of different types of white blood cells. Here you can see the, their normal numbers, all these little dots. And then you can see in these fish that we've engineered to uh, not have this gene called PARN, all those numbers of different white blood cells are reduced. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're all reduced. And so this suggests that in the fish model, like we see in the patients, there's a decrease of these white blood cells. This suggests that this gene really does cause this abnormality because we've been able to prove it in the zebrafish and now we can use these zebrafish to try to find drugs that can restore normal blood cell numbers and prevent leukemia from forming much like i showed you in the um uh, with the nup 98 hoxa 9. here though it's the reverse there we had increased blood cells and you got leukemia here we have decreased blood cells and you get leukemia this is another example of a bone marrow failure syndrome, and this is a well-known bone marrow syndrome, a bone marrow failure syndrome called Schwachmann Diamond syndrome, named for the two doctors who identified it. And in this syndrome, you have low numbers of white blood cells. The patients are uh, not of short stature. They also have pancreatic problems, much like in cystic fibrosis, and um, have can have uh, cognitive behavioral problems, and they also can develop um, MDS and AML. And most of these patients have muta mutations in this gene called SDBS. But again, our collaborator, Dr. Dror, found patients that have mutations in this gene called DNAJC21. And this is work that's been funded by the Leukemia Lymphoma Society of Canada. Um, this was a successful application last year to model this type of Schwachmann Diamond syndrome in the zebrafish to try to understand this disease better and find treatments. And so again, as you can see here, looking at different markers of stem cells and white blood cells. This is the normal number of white blood cells. And here we used a bit of a different technique, something called a morpholino, where we can block the expression of this gene in the zebrafish. 
and again, those white blood cell, blood cell numbers are reduced. So it may seem weird how if you have reduced white blood cell numbers, how does that lead to um, leukemia and blood cancers? And the reason is we believe that it's caused by other secondary abnormalities that occur. And one of those secondary abnormalities is a mutation in a gene called P53. And P53 is a tumor suppressor gene, which is a, uh, I mentioned before, oncogenes, the genes that are turned on and cause cancer, Tumor suppressor genes are genes that when they turn off, they cause cancer. And P53, its job is when there is some stress, DNA damage, some other problem that occurs, um, uh, this gene gets turned on. But when you have a mutation and P53 doesn't, um, isn't working properly, you can get tumors. Uh, this occurs in patients and also in zebrafish. So here's zebrafish that have these fish have abnormalities in P53 and have developed, here's a tumor in the tail of this adult zebrafish, and this is looking at the zebrafish looking down from the top, and here's, a, uh, here's a, uh, another tumor um, in the tail. And so we believe that in patients that have mutations in DNA JC21 and maybe lots of other bone marrow failure mutations, they then get mutations in P53 in this tumor suppressor, and that's what pushes their bone marrow failure to leukemia. And so because we have fish that don't have P53 and we're making fish that don't have DNA JC21, we can breed these together, study this phenomenon, and find new treatment. Now, I've been talking about how we use genetic techniques to study blood cancers in zebrafish. And so now I want to switch gears and talk about how we use transplant studies. And here what we do is we take human leukemia cells and label them and inject these into the zebrafish embryos, um, in this case, into the yolk sac, when the fish look like this, which is about two days of life, or 48 hours after they're born. Because we fluorescently labeled these cells, we can see them in the zebrafish, so this is in the cartoon, and you can see this here, these fluorescent cells. Um, and we do this using the Casper fish I showed you before that are these fish without their stripes that are completely transparent. And when we do that, you'll see in this little movie here, this is the fish, these are the blood vessels of the fish along here. Look carefully, because you'll see human blood cells that we've injected flying through the bloodstream. I think so. That movie, may, that movie may not be working. Okay, I'll move on. So we wanted to adapt this approach to uh, study uh, blood cells that we derive from patients. and so. Um, we got research ethics board approval at the IWK, which is the children's hospital here in Halifax that serves uh, all the children of the three maritime provinces. And with consent from the child and their parents, at the time that we do their bone marrow, we collect some extra cells from that patient, fluorescently label them, and inject them into our zebrafish. And then we can test the responses to different drugs, as I showed you, like with the decitabine, just by adding these to the water in which these baby zebrafish, the larvae, are, um, are swimming. And to date, we've collected over 50 samples from children uh, at the IWK. And this is an example. So this is from a patient. Uh, these are two patients that have a type of ALL called T-ALL, T-cell ALL, which is a high-risk type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And as you can appreciate, when we inject these cells into the zebrafish at baseline and then look at three days, uh, um, uh, post, uh, um, uh, post injecting them, we can see those cells um, grow in the fish. So this is where they start and they grow. So this is our timeline um, uh, at uh, how they grow over time. And what we wanted to do here is we wanted to treat these fish with different um, drugs that uh, target specific abnormalities that we know can be abnormal in T-cell ALL and for which we have specific targeted treatment. So here you can see that um, we treated these fish with this drug called rapamycin. Didn't seem to do much in patient one or in patient two. And in these fish, we treated them with a drug called compound E, which stopped the growth in patient one, um, but did not stop the growth in patient two. And what's amazing is that we then went back with that information and sequenced um, uh, the, the, some of the genes in patient one and found that that patient has a mutation in a gene called NOTCH, which is what was specifically targeted by this drug. 
And we're able to do these studies in the span of about a week. So that's pretty amazing because we could use this approach to try to find drugs that result in specific responses in specific patients. Um, and that's illustrated here. You can see what a big change in growth this patient had with this specific drug. And so if you were trying to decide whether you want to give this patient this drug or this drug, uh, the zebrafish could inform and personalize therapy for this patient in real time. And there's really no other model system that can do that um, that quickly. Over the last number of years, we've been refining our, our approach to do transplants of human cancer cells into, um, into zebrafish. I've shown you that we can inject into the yolk sac. Here, the cells are labeled in red. We can also inject into the, um, the hindbrain ventricles. So this is in the back of the brain of the fish. And we can follow those um, cells over the next few days. And we've used this to study solid tumors. So this is an example of solid tumor cells that we've injected. And you can appreciate that three days post-injection, these cells have spread throughout the fish. And so we can use this to study metastasis. More recently, while we initially were injecting into the yolk sac, our blood cancers, we've now started injecting into this structure called the ductive cuvier, which is located right here and leads into the blood vessels. And so you can see here, let's see if this movie plays. Oh, I don't know if it's going to play. Maybe not. But here we have uh, blood cells that we've injected that have spread uh, throughout, uh, throughout the zebrafish from being injected here. One of the other things we've done with this uh, model is we've tried to make these zebrafish more human. So while I mentioned zebrafish are very similar to humans, um, there are some differences. And we know that the behavior of leukemia cells has a lot to do with the genetics in the leukemia cell, but also things that are happening in the environment around the leukemia cells what proteins, what other factors are floating around in the environment. And as proof of that, we know that immunotherapy has made a difference in some blood cancers, and it functions to target some of these factors in the environment and help make them attack the leukemia cells. And so we made zebrafish engineered to express human factors like uh, stem cell factor, GMCSF, which is used as a therapeutic. It's like GCSF or filgrastim. It's used as a treatment um, in many chemotherapy regimens to rev up the bone marrow so that um, the periods of neutropenia aren't as long. And another factor called CXCL12 or SDF1. And these fish, what we've been able to show here is that when we take human AML cells, so these are again all from human AML patients, in this case, all children with AML, these fish um, uh, that have these, that express all these factors, die more quickly from their AML um, than those fish that don't express those factors, uh, which are shown in the blue line. And that's true in all of these cases. Um, and we believe that that suggests that these um, zebrafish that express these human factors are more human-like and a better example for us to study. We've also shown that these, these fish help the blood cells um, behave more like they would in a human being. And what I mean by that is they travel to the kidney marrow, to the bone marrow, just like you would when you do a, um, uh, um, a, a bone marrow transplant. When patients have a bone marrow transplant, they have um, the stem cells are injected into their bloodstream and find their way to the bone marrow. And here we find when we injected those uh, human uh, leukemia cells into regular fish, we don't see them traveling. They just sort of disappear over time. But in our, our special fish that express these human factors, we see those cells shown here that travel to the bone marrow just like they would in a patient. So for the last couple of uh, 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 moments of this presentation, I wanna shift gears from uh, using zebrafish to find new treatments to using zebrafish to find safer treatments. Because um, as I mentioned, most cancers now, uh, including blood cancers, continue to be treated with chemotherapy. And while we've had some great success, as I showed you, in pediatric cancers with survivors, that's a pretty high cost. Many of these patients may be cured of their cancers, but may then have a lifetime of side effects. And one of those, uh, of long-term side effects, and one of those most significant side effects is cardiac side effects, effects on their heart. And in um, one of the drugs that causes this is a drug called doxorubicin, which is part of a family called anthracyclines. 
And anthracyclins like doxorubicin, donorubicin, idorubicin, epirubicin, and mitoxantrone are used in many, many different types of blood cancers, leukemias, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphomas. And they can be effective, but they can cause cardiac damage. And many patients uh, can suffer uh, cardiac uh, problems, both in the short term and in the long term. And these are particularly severe in children, and I, especially in toddlers, which as I showed you in one of the first slides is the peak age that we see children uh, with leukemias. And so while we wanna be able to continue to use drugs like doxorubicin, can we find ways to give them more safely so it continues to uh, kill uh, the blood cancer cells without causing the damage in the heart cells? And actually, it's not just the heart damage that we worry about. At least in children, this was a study done a couple of years ago that showed that patients that had um, that received um, doxorubicin or donorubicin in this case and had uh, heart abnormalities actually did worse from a leukemia point of view as well. Um, those patients um, who had decreased heart function had poor event-free survival and overall survival as shown by the blue and orange lines here compared to the green lines of patients that did not. So this is pretty significant. It's not good for their hearts and it's not even good for their treatment um, from leukemia. And the zebrafish is a good um, uh, uh, model for us to look at the hearts. As you can see from this video here, this is a zebrafish embryo with a green glowing heart. The, the heart is outlined in green, the heart cells glow green, and the zebrafish has a very similar heart to humans with an atrium and a ventricle that beats very similar to humans, but it only has one atrium and one ventricle, whereas humans, we have two atria and two ventricles. But the way it functions is quite similar. And so in fact, when we treat zebrafish embryos with anthracycline drugs by adding them to the water. So here we're adding doxorubicin to the water. I hope you can appreciate this is the zebrafish heart, how it normally looks here. And when it's been, when you've added doxorubicin, it gets all swollen and abnormal looking um, and doesn't function as well. And this is very similar to what we see in patients that have cardiac damage from, uh, from doxorubicin. And so together with a, a, a group in Boston, we uh, undertook a screen using zebrafish larvae, and here we tested 3,000 compounds to find drugs that when you gave them at the same time of the doxorubicin added these drugs to the water, they prevented that abnormal heart um, uh, 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 picture that I just showed you with the, with the swollen um, uh, dysfunctional heart. And when we did this, we identified these two drugs called visnagin and diphenylurea, that were protective. They protected the heart um, from um, uh, the negative effects of the doxorubicin and made the hearts not only look normal, but function normal as shown by these graphs here. But importantly, without compromising um, how it worked on the cancer cells. And so we took these fish and we injected human leukemia cells. And you can see here that um, uh, those human leukemia cells grow um, in the blue bar here. Um, but when we add doxorubicin, we can kill those cancer cells and we can maintain those killing of cancer cells even when we give the doxorubicin with either of these protective compounds. And so this suggests that this may be a safer way to give doxorubicin, that we can give these drugs um, uh, with protective agents, protect the heart and still kill the cancer cells. Now we know that not all patients are equally susceptible to developing these abnormalities um, uh, 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 to uh, drugs like doxorubicin. We know that in a lot of these drugs, it has to do with the dose and the dose over time, but some patients we may give a little dose to and they may develop heart problems, and other patients may receive a large dose of these drugs um, and not develop any heart problems. And so a number of groups, including um, the group uh, in Vancouver, uh, uh, which, is, which leads this uh, network called the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network, is looking at genes that, that uh, people have that might predispose them to developing side effects from chemotherapy, like the side effects I just showed you from uh, doxorubicin. And you know, we could all be walking around with some of these abnormalities and we would never know until we're exposed to that drug. And if you were never exposed to that drug in your lifetime, you, you, you might not know. But then if you're exposed to that drug, it may compromise the ability for you to have the right therapy to get rid of your blood cancer. 
And so what this group identified is they found an abnormality in a gene called RARG, and this made patients more susceptible to developing side effects, uh, cardiac side effects from anthracyclines. And RARG is in the family of drugs, uh, is in the family of genes of something called the retinoic acid receptor. And retinoic acid is a drug that's FDA approved. Um, it's the, uh, it also goes by the trade name of Accutane. It's used to treat a number of cancers like acute promyelocytic leukemia or APL, but also Accutane, as I think many people are familiar with, is also used to treat acne. So this is something that's very widely available. And so this suggests that we might be able to improve the side effects from anthracycline toxicity using drugs that specifically target um, RARG, like retinoic acid. And so we showed this in zebrafish. Here's a normal zebrafish uh, larvae. Again, if we expose it to doxorubicin, they get a big swollen heart that doesn't function well. And here, if we give them with doxorubicin and uh, an atra or accutane retinoic acid, we're able to protect the heart and restore normal function. And so this really shows how we can use the zebrafish to try to find protective, safer drugs, particularly in these most vulnerable populations of patients that have um, uh, genes that predispose them to having really uh, awful side effects. And this idea of cancer survivors and side effects of cancer survivors has really gained um, uh, a lot of interest. And this is a, a recent um, news article in the journal Science, which is a very prestigious uh, scientific journal, and they interviewed a number of us working this working in this area um, around the world. Um, and the title of this was "Treatments for Childhood Cancer Can Devastate Lives Later." Scientists are trying to change that, and they specifically make reference to some of the work that I was just talking about um, using zebrafish. So we are really proud to be part of this to increase that kind of awareness both uh, are in the scientific community and uh, more broadly in the public. So I hope today I've been able to show you that the zebrafish is a really useful model for studying human leukemia and pre-leukemia disorders. And I've talked about a number of different examples, but we also uh, study in our lab um, uh, specific populations, specific types of leukemias that affect really vulnerable children, such as the leukemias that occur in infants and in, in children with Down syndrome. Uh, those are particularly uh, interesting leukemias. They're very unique, and we're trying to find the best ways to treat those disorders. I've shown you that using genetic approaches, we can put leukemia-causing genes into the zebrafish, see changes in blood development, and then use that to screen for new uh, medications that may be able to restore normal blood development. Because the zebrafish larvae that we use are see-through, we can transplant human leukemia cells from patients into the fish, and we can do this in real time. We can take those cells from the patient and transplant them the next day and use this to try to help see which is the best treatment so we can personalize um, leukemia therapy for patients. And then lastly, childhood cancer survivors, while we've seen a, a great improvement um, in their uh, outcome and now have um, many, many childhood cancer survivors, they suffer from late effects of chemotherapy. And you can imagine if you're treating a four-year-old and they survive their cancer, they have many, many decades of life. And we've now given them all sorts of chronic problems, including um, heart damage. Uh, we also in our lab study the hearing loss and kidney damage that can occur from chemotherapy. And the zebrafish is really a powerful tool to be able to model these abnormalities, um, these complications, and find protective drugs that we can give so that treatment can be given more safely. So with that, I'll end. I want to acknowledge um, the current members of my lab, um, uh, the former members of my lab. I've had the opportunity to train a lot of people, um, uh, the people that we collaborate with, um, uh, our funding sources, and particularly uh, the LLSC that's funded a couple of our projects and our trainees. Uh, they have been a wonderful partner uh, in our uh, uh, efforts to improve the outcome of uh, children and adults with blood cancers. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Berman. That was really amazing. Some really amazing research happening. Um, and so moving forward, uh, let's take some questions. And remember, um, everyone is on mute, so you can you can ask your questions using the chat function or the questions function. 
Uh, I will ask the questions and Dr. Berman, um, you can answer those. So let's go take a look and see what we have. Uh, first question, where do you keep all the fish? Oh, that's a good question. So we have a facility at, uh, at Dalhousie University here in Halifax. Um, it's quite a large facility. The fish are kept in uh, individual tanks based on the type of fish so that we don't have them uh, mixed up. And so that facility has the capacity for about 60,000 zebrafish. We probably have close to about 20,000 zebrafish in there right now of 100 different types of genetic backgrounds. That's amazing. Uh, let's see here. What is the lifespan of a zebrafish? So zebrafish in the wild will live to be about four or five years of age, but in captivity in our system, we usually don't want them to live beyond uh, three years or so because then they can develop um, uh, infections. And our system is a continuous flow system. All the tanks are linked together by a single water source. And so if one fish got infected, they could potentially uh, make all the fish quite sick and wipe out the colony. And so we really want to keep our fish optimally healthy. So we usually keep them for about three years. Okay. Uh, another question here. Um, is this study for children only or do you, uh, or also older adults? So as a pediatric oncology, uh, obviously I have an interest in childhood blood cancers, but we, um, we study um, adult cancers as well. Um, in fact, the, 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 the work that I showed you on uh, the NUP98 HOXA9 fish, that abnormality in AML is much more common in adults uh, than, than in children. Um, we've also studied a number of adult solid tumors in our transplant models, including prostate cancer and lung cancer. So we've, we've, we've adapted this model for both childhood cancers and adult cancers. Okay. Uh, I have another good question here is, how will the findings of these studies be applied to conventional treatment options? So that's a great question. So one of the opportunities and advantages I have as a, as a physician uh, researcher and being a clinician myself is the ability to promote these findings and uh, help take this work to clinical trials. And in addition to the research that I do in the lab, the preclinical research, I'm also involved in uh, running a number of uh, leukemia uh, clinical trials for children uh, in Canada and in North America. So, you know, uh, the, the idea is a lot of these new treatments would probably be um, looked at in the context of um, uh, a relapse, a relapse setting. And right now we're part of a national project that's looking at um, uh, hard to treat childhood cancers um, from across the country, um, which includes high risk, uh, high risk leukemias, where um, that patient's leukemia would be sequenced to identify a specific mutation. And then hopefully we would get a sample from that patient to put in the fish and we would then be able to, based on the sequencing information, we would be able to test drugs that um, uh, um, match specific targets to see which would be the best one for that patient to use. So we're not quite doing that yet, but we're really on the verge of being able to apply this technology in that way. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, here we go. Um, are you able to utilize CRISPR technology with your zebrafish? So I missed that. Utilize what kind of technology? I'm sorry, it's C R I S P R. CRISPR. Yes. Yeah, so I, I didn't mention it because I didn't want to get into the technical details. But many of the mutants that we have, and some of the mutants that I showed you, the p53 mutants, the um, the DNA JC21 mutants. Those fish were made using CRISPR. So CRISPR, just for folks that aren't familiar on the phone, is a technique to um, play around with the, with the zebrafish genome to knock out genes or insert specific genes, kind of like a cut and paste the way you would um, when you're doing a, a, a document in Word and you remove a word or a, a punctuation and stick it in a different place. We're able to do that in the genome using CRISPR, and it's been a really powerful tool to make uh, to introduce specific mutations in the zebrafish to match what happens in patients. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. Has zebrafish been used for developing new treatments for uh, multiple myeloma as well? And if so, what is the status of those treatments? 
So that's a great question. We actually have done a little bit of work uh, in, in, in myeloma. Myeloma is not um, a disease that occurs in children, and so it hasn't been a focus in the lab. But we've actually done some uh, work together with uh, Dr. Jeanette Boudreau here at Dalhousie, who's an immunologist, and she studies using NK cells, which is sort of a type of immune cell, um, to see if we can use the NK cells to target myeloma cells. And so um, we've done, we've used zebrafish and injected human myeloma cells and human NK cells and shown that the NK cells um, go and, and, and um, line up with the, with the myeloma cells. And so we're going to do, that's some early work. We're going to see if we can use this approach to uh, test if we can get the NK cells to, uh, to, kill, uh, to kill myeloma cells. So that's some of the work that we've done. There have been some other uh, folks who have used genetic approaches, like I showed at the beginning, to um, uh, model, um, uh, model myeloma uh, in, in, in the zebrafish. And so there are some ongoing um, studies um, looking at myeloma and zebra. Excellent, thank you. Uh, do you collaborate with the studies and research being conducted at PMH in Toronto? Um, so uh, we have not specifically, we've, we, again, we've tended to collaborate uh, more with folks at SickKids in Toronto because um, we're looking at more pediatric cancers, and so I've reached out to my colleagues there. Um, uh, but um, I do know a, a number of the researchers at PMH, particularly the AML uh, researchers there. And actually, for one of our projects, we did reach out to folks there to get a technique for how better to label uh, the, uh, the leukemia cells um, that we were injecting into the fish. So, uh, but I think there's opportunities for us to uh, to collaborate with them as well. There is a, there isn't anyone at PMH that does uh, zebrafish models. They do a lot of mouse models. And so I think there's opportunities for us to um, uh, do some uh, zebrafish models uh, uh, in parallel with their mouse models. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question here is, do zebrafish have cells similar to platelets and thrombocytes? And do fish with AML develop thrombocytopenia? Great, that's a great question. So um, zebrafish do have uh, cells like platelets. They have, and they're, they're called thrombocytes in, in the zebrafish. Um, we have not specifically looked in um, our, the AML fish or, the, uh, the, um, uh, or our bone marrow failure fish if their platelet levels are low, um, uh, but, but, we, but we should. That, that's a great thing to look at. They, they do develop, I have a colleague who's a zebrafish researcher and a hematologist in Michigan, and he studies uh, blood clots in zebrafish uh, looking at platelets. And so like in humans, those platelets can accumulate and cause blood clots and, and bleeding problems and those other kinds of things. So, so that really is conserved in the zebrafish. Excellent, thank you. Um, are zebrafish utilized by other researchers internationally, and is it better experimental? Is it a better experimental system than using mice, for example? Oh, so that's a bit of a loaded question. But the <laughs> um, so uh, is it used internationally? So zebrafish. Um, so I'll, I'll answer that question like this: um, the, the zebrafish field really has existed since the '60s, where people were looking at zebrafish to understand normal developmental biology. Um, but the field where we use zebrafish to model human disease is really pretty new. It's about 20 years old. And we now have a whole international society called the Zebrafish um, um, uh, Disease um, Modeling Society. We hold international meetings. And in fact, there's a big meeting in Boston next month. There'll be about 400 people at that meeting. And I and folks from my lab are going there. People use zebrafish not only to study blood cancers, but all types of cancers and actually all types of human diseases from um, Alzheimer's to autism to addiction to really the entire breadth because of all that degree of conservation. Are they a better model than mice? There's certain things that we can do faster and more efficiently in the zebrafish um, and certainly more cost effectively than in mice, but mice are still gonna be a closer model to humans because they're, they're mammals, whereas zebrafish are not. And so really the idea is not to do zebrafish or mice, it's really to do use both models together um, and take advantages of the strengths of those models to answer questions in human disease. Excellent, thank you. 
Uh, let's see here. I have about two more questions. So uh, first, uh, before last one would be, is your research able to be extrapolated to test drugs for adult MDS patients? Yeah, so we so that's a great question. So we do have, I didn't have time to talk about it today. We have recently been modeling uh, MDS and the zebrafish, specifically MDS that uh, has um, loss of a gene called TET2, which is one of the most common, probably the second most common mutation in adult MDS. And we now have these zebrafish that have abnormal blood development that lack uh, TET2. Um, and so um, we've been understanding, we've been using those fish to understand how losing TET2 makes uh, these fish developing, develop MDS and develop uh, AML. And, and now we're really poised to start using these fish to start looking for uh, new treatments. So uh, hopefully that will be, that will be really helpful. And, and, and I think we'll have the opportunity to look at other types of MDS and zebrafish as well. Thank you so much for that. All right, I have two last questions about CAR-T, so I'm gonna combine them both because uh, they're both pretty interesting. So how does the zebrafish study compare to CAR-T therapy and about using CAR-T cells with the zebrafish? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, CAR-T cells have gained a lot of popularity and they've been found to be very successful in some types of leukemias and lymphoma, specifically targeting CD19 that's expressed on uh, immature B cells, so it's been effective in diseases like um, uh, acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia um, and some lymphomas that have uh, uh, that express that that CD19. Um, we know that uh, CAR T cells is the answer for some things, but it's not the answer for every for everything because we need to be able to one have a target to design the CAR T cell around. And two, and we've had this with some of our patients where they haven't been able to have enough lymphocytes to be collected to make the CAR T cells to be successful. So for some patients, there just isn't the, even if you have the target, because they don't have enough of their own lymphocytes, the CAR T cells can't be engineered. So um, that's to say that, you know, I think we need to use things like zebrafish and other systems to identify other targets that may not be, um, you know, amenable to CAR T cells. But also, you know, CAR T cells are one example of immunotherapy, and we're starting to use the zebrafish to um, to try to, to to see if we can study immunotherapy, not just uh, drugs, but immunotherapy in the zebrafish. And I alluded to that example um, where we were um, with the NK cells, and we now are have a project where we're going to be looking at can we use rituximab, which is a uh, a drug that um, is really the original immunotherapy that's used in B cell. Uh, uh, cancers like um, uh, like Burkitt's lymphoma um, that specifically targets CD20 and can we um, you know can what can we use the zebrafish to look at antibodies like rituximab and and immune therapy and maybe we'll be able to study CAR T cells um, uh, in the zebrafish. We're not quite there yet, but it's something that we're hoping to look at. Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for all your questions. Um, I'd like to remind everyone to not hesitate to contact us if you need more information. You can do so by calling toll-free or by email at canadainfo at lls.org. So if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to use that website. Also check out our website regularly for the dates of our upcoming webcasts or to watch all past webcasts. Please note that a short survey will be sent out to all participants after this webcast. We would greatly appreciate you taking a moment to fill it in as it will help us to better offer you the most valuable information in the near future. Thank you again for joining us and have a nice day.